have to admit that I'm as guilty as anybody of thinking that something or other that happened must be a sign. A couple of weeks ago, I left the ATM machine and I left my debit card at the machine. And that meant for over a week, I couldn't get any more money out of an ATM machine. <laughs> that was a sign that I was not supposed to spend any more money. Actually, it was just a stupid mistake. But it was a sign. And too many times we end up doing that. We assign a meaning way beyond what it's called for. Sometimes we think of other times or other cultures as being so unsophisticated because they talk about believing in omens. There was a meteor in the sky at the time so-and-so was born, and that means that person is destined to be a great person in history. I don't think a meteor has anything to do with what one decides to do with their life. There's no connection logically, scientifically, or any other way, but the omen was there. And so we want to use those kinds of omens and signs as proof of something or other, indicators of something or other. There's a little more pernicious way that we sometimes look for signs. It's when we pray something like, God, if you're there, then this is what you'll do for me. And we do it with one another, too. If you love me, this is what you'll do for me. It's, yeah, you've got to give me the right sign. If you really expect me to believe what you're saying is true. Is that what faith is all about? You've got to have the proof and some kind of omen, some kind of sign, some action from somebody else, some event in history. Is that what we're talking about when we're talking about faith? John 3.16 is that famous verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes, but what does that mean? Whoever believes. Believes in what? You know, I grew up with creeds coming out the ears. You had to believe this, 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 and this. And then when you got a certain age, the creed wasn't enough. You had to go to catechism class and you had to believe a lot more. And then when you went to the seminary, it wasn't just a catechism, it was a whole book that you had to know and believe and accept as true. So one statement after another had to be believed if you were going to be able to claim you had saving faith. And then a strange thing happened. I got to know God. And all of those statements that people were making really didn't matter at all. Because I don't believe God is anything about making an A on some kind of test at the end of three years of catechism. I don't believe God requires us to have an IQ of 150 before we can get into heaven. When we're talking about a God who loves the world, we're talking about that's what we're supposed to be believing. We're talking about a faith that says love is real. Love is stronger than hate. You can conquer evil with good. The world might not always be a good place. Your body may be racked with pain. All kinds of natural disasters may be happening. There may be violence all around your neighborhood and your nation. But love is still real. Love is still stronger than all of those things. And eventually that goodness, that love is going to win out. What is all this faith about? It really isn't about knowing everything in the scripture. It isn't really about needing something, some kind of omen or sign. It's about trusting in that love. And yet at the same time, we are given signs. In the first lesson, we talked about 
we heard this morning. The children of Israel were being afflicted by poisonous snakes. And so God told Moses, make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and whoever looks at it will be healed. That was a sign, something tangible, something anchored in time and space that they could look at. And there was healing. The problem was, we don't hear much more about it, that bronze serpent on a pole. Until hundreds of years later, King Hezekiah has to destroy it because that bronze serpent on a pole is still existing and the people are bringing it out and reverencing it and worshiping it. And so Moses, who got so upset because when he was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments that said, don't make any graven images, the people were down below making a golden calf. And he got all upset because they'd made a graven image. So what did Moses do with the plague of snakes? He made a graven image. And sure enough, the people started worshiping it. And so we can have our signs, we can have our symbols, and they can become our idols. We have things like crosses, we have things like Bibles, and they can be for us representations and ways of communicating to us something on a spiritual level, but too often they become our idols. We start reverencing the book, we start worshiping the cross. And our faith is no longer in the God who so loved the world. So we need to be very careful with what we do with our signs and our symbols. We have two other symbols, two other signs that we use quite often. They're called baptism and Holy Communion. And it allows us to anchor in time and space, allows us to mark a fact that we are loved, that we are part of a greater community. And so many times that is deeply touching to us. When we are baptized, when we see somebody else baptized, we recognize, yes, what we are saying is this person is a child of God, this person is part of the beloved community, this person is my brother and sister. And when we have communion, we are celebrating the fact that we have a unity with one another and that we all together know that we are united with that love that is divine, that conquers everything, that never changes, that always seeks the good. So we celebrate communion, but we don't worship it. We don't worship the bread or the wine. We worship we count worthy that which is love itself. That which motivates us, that which heals us, that which lifts us up, that which inspires us to do good in this world. Those of you that have been raised in other faiths, have you noticed that we don't have a creed that we recite together? in our worship service? Did you miss it? There isn't a list of statements you have to believe is true. What we do want to say to one another, what we do want to believe is true, what we do want to say this is salvation is there is love and love is real and love is for all. And with that faith we are motivated to act in love toward everybody and that love seeks justice for everybody and that love seeks healing for everybody and that love accepts one and all. What is faith? What is saving faith? What does it mean to believe in the one whose name we're supposed to believe in according to that text? Well, it doesn't mean you have to believe Jesus Christ. You don't even have to know those words because a name wasn't about the sounds of somebody's label. 
The name was the essence. The name signified the being. And the being of Christ was love. Love with flesh on it. Divine love being revealed in human action. When we talk about the name of Jesus, that's what we're talking about. Divine love in human action. That brings salvation. That brings healing and peace. That's what makes us whole. So it's not the words. It's not the stories printed in a book. It's the essence of love itself. That's what saving faith is. Because when we live in that faith, what we do, we don't have to worry about hiding. We do it in the light. We don't do the deeds of darkness as if we know something that we do might be wrong. But when we live in love, we know that what we're doing is motivated by love, and we don't have to hide that. We shouldn't ever have to hide our love. May your faith be in the God who loves all, who loved the world. That means you. Amen. Amen.